Thank you. Thank you, Saros, very much for the introduction. I'll try to show some of the things we, we plan to do so that we are also held accountable. And uh, thanks also to the COMS team, Miriam and Sarah are here for organizing this. And the PIR team, some members are here, some others couldn't come. Dambuts, Norhan, uh, Carolina, Chris are here. Uh, thanks so much also to our partners, WHO and our donors for supporting this work. So first of all, what is the motivation? Sarosh already mentioned some of the challenges in the water sector, but what I wanted to highlight is the, length, the huge challenge that the world is facing in achieving sustainable development goal number six. We are not on track. This is the reality. And we know that current investment levels in the sector globally, but also country by country, will need to increase four or five or even six times to achieve SDGs 6.1 and 6.2. Very difficult to do it only with public resources. Even with the multilaterals and bilaterals, it's impossible to reach the investment levels needed. And Sarosh already alluded to how to bring other sources of financing to the sector. So this is a huge challenge. But to address it, we need also to address some of the very well-known constraints of limited capacity, not only financial but institutional, overlapping roles of different institutions, intergovernmental coordination, we are talking a lot about that in, that in this report as well, and realistic policies and reforms. Everybody wants to achieve sustainable development goal and universal access, but what are the policies, what are the resources to get to that end? Limited supervision, oversight, transparency, and cookie cutter approaches. It works here, it's going to work everywhere. So the PIR initiative started a few years ago. The first report was published in 2017. It was the PIR report. After that, we have applied it in 20 countries. And this is very important because we keep learning from implementation of our studies and reports. After the application in an initial group of 20 countries of the, of the PIR framework, we learned, we drew some lessons. And we are updating this report to include emerging priorities of intergovernmental relations. I mentioned that resilience and finance. Very quickly, policy direction. What do we mean by this? Government programs, pro poor policies, are there pro poor policies or not? Budget allocations, yes, we want to achieve universal access. What are the resources available from the budget to get to that end? Private sector participation, their role, is it enabled or not? So this is on the policy side of PIR. Sorry, if I'm going up, I should be going down. Institutional arrangement, very well known, decentralization. Is the sector centralized or not? Roles of the municipalities, roles of the provinces, the utilities, are they national, subnational? The institutional structure of the industry, executing agencies, regulatory agencies, agencies in charge of policy and service providers. Asset ownership, who owns the asset and what is the relationship with the other sector? Regulation is not only the traditional economic regulation. What is the purpose of for regulation in a certain country, environmental and health regulation, and different types of re regulation. We need to be mindful that it's not only about having a regulator or a regu regulatory agency in place. There are other forms of regulation, such as regulation by contract, which is the prevailing model in West Africa, for example. So all this PIR, take us to the issue of incentives. And this is what we are trying to understand better and explain better with this stream of work of PIA. What are the incentive structure emanating from policies, institutions, and regulation? And I wanted to show you uh, a result that, a, a slide that reflects the results of a study the World Bank did with Musu, water services for the urban poor in Africa, that identified, I mean, after a series of interviews with key players, in, in, in four countries in Africa, identify again issues related to PIR as the key drivers of I improving the incentives for service delivery. And here there is something very interesting, including for us as a lending institution, the need to focus more on performance, on, on performance of the service providers and performance-based finance. And I will come back to that. PIR has evolved. As I said, we started with a concept. We applied it in the second phase in 20 countries. We draw lessons from there, and we are updating the framework. Whose application, Sarosh was saying that he will held us accountable for, and I will show you how. So three phases, initial concept, testing in 20 countries, and then the final framework and report that we are launching here today. 
The concept, I would say, is simple. Basically, what is PIR? We talk about best fit, not any longer about best practices, because we have moved away from the idea that if some, something works in the UK, or works in the US, or Japan, it's going to work in Argentina. And it doesn't happen that way. Holistic in the sense that we are tackling the three together, policies, institutions, and regulation, because we have learned that by supporting reforms in one of those dimensions that we have done many times before, we, create, we support the creation of a regulator, but without the adequate financing policies and institutional architecture is not working. So we, we bring them together to create incentives. Incentives, as you see there, enabling environment, it is what is above the water sector. Reforms, wider reforms of the economy, or the governance in a country, like decentralizing all services, not only water, bringing the private sector has a bearing on the policies, institutions, and regulation in the water sector that should provide the incentives for improving water and sanitation services delivery. And we propose a feedback loop to constantly improve the enabling environment to improve the delivery of services. So this is the framework. It's very well articulated in the report. We have applied it in all continents, in all regions, in 20 countries, and we have drawn lessons. You can see there are so diverse countries as Brazil and Kenya, very diverse, and countries all over the world, and we have extracted lessons, some of which uh, are very relevant for the transformation of the sector. I will share now a few key messages. Some of them are evident, but I wanted nevertheless to highlight. One, PIR is a precondition for resolving some of the chronic challenges undermining WSS services. Sarosh already alluded to that. Without a solid PIR framework and governance framework, it's impossible to achieve the sustainable development goals. Progress in achieving meaningful PIR reforms starts with a rigorous assessment, and this is critical again, rigorous assessment, and I will show you one example of the root causes of water supply and sanitation bottlenecks. And third, and I would say this is what I take as the main message from this work, is that reforms take time. We have to be patient. Reforms and research do not happen overnight. What is important is learning and also working for the development partners and IFI's organizations such as the World Bank in the long term with countries. It's not that we go there, we bring a project, we think that we will transform the sector and we leave. That doesn't happen. We are thinking of longer term engagements and we are adapting some of our lending tools to this idea of staying working with the countries in the, in the pathway to change the sector for the long term. I mentioned before the emerging um, areas of work of PIR, intergovernmental financing and resilience. But let me go through very quickly through the messages, main messages. I talked about the precondition, the importance of PIR. This is not from the World Bank. I mean, I'm quoting here a report from the Global, is the Global Water Policy Report that interviewed 86 or policy makers in 86 countries that again identified PIR and lack of coordination and fragmentation in the water sector as the main cause for failure to achieve sustainable development goals ahead of infrastructure, ahead of investments. Now, it's not only the past, but also the future, the emerging issues. We have learned from COVID that we need comprehensive approaches. I mean, the, the importance of WASH for addressing and mitigating COVID was clear, but did we have the tools? Were we equipped to work with the health sector? with the municipalities, with the urban authorities. We have learned that more needs to be done in terms of PIR wider than in the water sector. Financial viability of utilities, we know that utilities in general in developing countries are not financially viable. Now we have the day zero events. Many people attribute them to lack of water, that is true. But with better planning and with better PIR and better regulation that can also address, as Saros was mentioning, demand management and efficiency, you will be better prepared for the day zero days that are coming all around the world. And millions of people, of course, will. So these, these are issues that are intensified challenges from what we had when we started this work. But also the new opportunities, climate change, of course, and the impacts on water services. <coughs> can we still look at the water sector, water supply and sanitation, as we did 10 or 20 years ago? 25 years ago, when the first regulator of the new wave, the OFWAT, in the UK was created, this didn't exist those days. And many countries, including mine, Argentina, copied literally the regulatory system of the UK 
And that was fine in terms of creating more transparency and incentives for the private sector. Is it enough today? No. And of what is working on the emerging issues associated to climate change, resilience, and technology to adapt the regulations to this new world. And I'm mentioning the technological innovations, digitalization, desalination, reuse, big issues. In a world of scarcity, desalination and reuse are two new sources of water, but that requires reconceptualizing all our paradigms about regulation, but also incentives and financing. Second message, I already talked about this, but I wanted to mention the example of Zambia, as many other countries, because it's very telling. This is, I mean, it's a complicated figure, but the main message here is that the previous assessment for Zambia, why are we failing? Oh, because we don't have enough money, so let's bring more money. But they, they didn't address the fundamental issues of lack of pro-poor policies in the policies for the sector in general. There was no focus on the poor, who are those who don't have access to, to the services. But also the lack of regulatory systems to address what happens outside the current grid, what happens outside the sewers. How do you incentivize the service providers to, co to provide services with beyond the network? And this was identified, and there is a new policy in place in the country reflecting these factors. But again, the important message here is root causes, understanding well what's going on, so you can design better solutions. Three, I mentioned before the long term. This is very important and I like to give the example of Colombia. Why? Because Colombia is a very good case of a constant evolution of the PIR in particular regulation. CRA, the regulator of Colombia, is one of the world class regulators. And they are continually evolving. They started in the mid 90s with the sector reforms to, to consolidate the performance of the service providers, and then gradually they move to results-based regulation, and currently they are thinking how to incorporate those emerging issues that I mentioned before, such as water scarcity, risk-based regulation, digitalization, and others into the new regulatory models. But do not think that Colombia didn't have any problem. There are ups and downs, and we have to be mindful that that is going to happen. What is important is the long term. Now, Saros was saying, I will hold my team accountable for the results. So this is an example of what our teams, both regional and global, will be held accountable for. We are applying the PIR methodology to the design of our new operations. This is what we call the phase, phase three, scaling up PIR, incorporating PIR into all our projects. And so it, this is an example from Nigeria. It's a huge program. It's 1.2 billion from the government, uh, 1.2 billion in general, of which 700 million dollars are from the World Bank. It's an operation that we call, is an instrument that we call P4R, Program for Results. So we disperse not against inputs as we traditionally do. We disperse against the achievement of results. And so this was a fantastic opportunity to create incentives. What we learned before, what was identified in cities in Africa, that resources should go to reward those who achieve results and performance. We are applying here in a, this big program in Nigeria. Nigeria is a very complicated country in terms of the sector. Why? Because it's federal. And I don't mean that federal countries are complicated, but when you have a national government that has the resources and the power and the policies and implementation happens down there, at the state or local level, you have to see how that intergovernmental dynamics is working. So what we are trying to do here with what you see there, DLIs, these are dis disbursement link linked indicators. That means that we disperse at the federal level against the establishment and implementation of a national WASH fund. But that fund is not any fund. It's a fund that needs to incorporate incentives in the disbursement mechanisms. Second disbursement condition is PIR plans at the state level. Again, it's a federal country, so we, we ask the participating states to have a PIR for reforms at the state level, and we disperse first against the approval of the plan, and second, annually, against the implementation of the plan. And third, the performance improvement action plans of the state level utility. So this is, these disbursements go against KPIs. So to conclude, 
Obviously, performs are key to achieve sustainable development goal number six. I, I hope we made the case for that, but they require one, strength and coordination and collaboration with all sector actors and like-minded partners, and again, also at, outside the sector. This is very important to highlight. Operationalization of PIR through sector investments, technical assistance, and capacity building. And finally, improving data collection and continue to document as we are doing with these 20 cases and share success stories and other stories, failures as well, in the future. Thank you very much.